do to help me present it. Yes, I am. So I will uh, kind of walk down through what I put in there and then he can fill in the blanks or vice versa. So um, we have a MAT patient um, that reported to us that uh, her sublocade was wearing off after one week of receiving it. So, and this was a, a repeated kind of thing. So uh, the patient is a 32 year old female from the Wheeling area, uh, no known allergies or significant health history information. Um, she is enrolled in the federal drug court program. So it's a drug court through um, the US, United States probation office. And she lives in a local or lived in a local recovery house during the time. Um, she began in our MAT program on Suboxone film, uh, 16 milligram daily from February of 21 to April of two, uh, 2022. And then she left at that point without any explanation and returned, oops, sorry, returned um, shortly thereafter and was started back on the 16 milligram Suboxone film. It was at that point that she was enrolled in this federal probation uh, program where they uh, didn't want her to use Suboxone film and in fact required her to switch to Sublicade. So I believe Dr. Corder uh, transitioned and worked with the team to transition her on to Sublicade at that point, um, which was about uh, March of 2022. And then she remained on Sublicade while in that uh, federal drug court program until she completed it in April of 23. Uh, throughout the entire course of her time, or at least a large portion of it, um, the time on Sublicade, she complained of it wearing off after the first week after receiving it. A little more detail on data. She was prescribed 16 milligrams of Suboxone, then transitioned to Sublicade 300 milligrams, um, then down to 100. And due to the reports of it wearing off after a week or so, she was put back up to the 300 milligrams. She was also prescribed um, oxcarbazepine, 150 milligrams PO for bipolar disorder and bupropion for smoking cessation. Lab results during the time when she was on Sublicade uh, looks like they were consistently higher on buprenorphine quality than our quantity versus the norbuprenorphine, though that may or may not be related. So our question, and Dr. Corder um, can posit this or fill in any blanks for me, is there any rational explanation for the sublocade wearing off so soon, um, maybe any drug on drug interactions or has anyone else had any experience with folks saying that sublocade wears off that soon after receiving it? And the one thing I, I would add a little bit to that is as soon as she uh, got off of a federal probation or whatever it was, um, under the auspices of the court, she came to us and asked to be put back on uh, the Suboxone film. And uh, this time she's been stable, uh, I guess, for almost a year now on, on 12 milligrams. Go ahead, Adina. Thank you for raising hand, Future. Hey, um, I had a question. In terms of the, the symptoms she reported, what did she say exactly? Because we had a patient, we had to have two patients like that who said that their medications wore up very quickly. And when we actually saw the patient, they described symptoms of withdrawal, but they actually had a serotonin syndrome that was precipitated by supplicate. So, I mean, and for them, it was the exact same symptoms like the sweating, um, feeling getting confused, getting antsy, getting agitated, and so forth. Um, yeah, I can answer that. She uh, mostly reported having. Um, uh, cravings uh, and and uh, that were much better controlled on Suboxone for her. Um, she may have had some of the symptoms of feeling with uh, some, you know, that she attributed to withdrawal, which is just some general restlessness. Um, were, were your patients on other serotonin agents? Um, very tiny doses. One was, and they also said they had cravings too. They felt like the Suboxone was just gone. But one was on um, venlafaxine, 37.5, and the other oh. was on sertraline, 50. Yeah, not big enough doses you'd act normally see that, huh?
So I'm guessing everyone's thinking, and I'll, I'll uh, uh, throw in the, the additional uh, information too is, um, was there any, would there be the possibility of any um, drug interactions to given the fact that she was on uh, trileptal? Or has anybody had any experience with that? Please feel free to chat in. I see your raised hand. Um, David, you can go ahead and speak, please. So, no, I haven't had experience with trileptal, but I haven't used a lot of sublocate. But one of the patients we had on, we had her on four months of the 300, and we still had her on the oral because she was withdrawing. Um, and then took her off the 300 and she was fine on their previous dose of 16 milligrams. Um, so again, I don't know. And I was going to try to pull up her results for levels that we had. Um, but she, it just didn't seem to, she said it didn't work at all for her. Um, and she's still in the program doing well. It's been on 16 milligrams of um, sub, suboxone sublingual film for several years, I think three, four years. So, and she was on multiple other medications. So I don't think it was um, kind of a serotonin syndrome um, type picture. Cause let me, I can pull up from, I was trying to remember what medicine she was on, but she was on um, Depakote, um, Venlafaxine. Yeah, so those, so I don't think it was, and then when she stopped that, she just continued fine on it, so. And then I, I guess I, I would I would wonder too, if there's just a, a subset of, of folks maybe that do better with just taking a medicine every day versus- Yeah, and I don't know, in this patient, not. the one that we had, she um, previously had trouble with taking too much buprenorphine films because she felt that she had cravings and, you know, in West Virginia, 16s are top. So, mm -hmm. um, so she tended to have those cravings. So I don't know if that maybe she would be less successful on the sublocade or not, or she metabolized different. Her levels weren't necessarily any, they didn't stand out to me as being super low or anything like that. They weren't as high as other people's, but again, that's hard to judge time of day and all those things really hadn't factored that in. Thank you. And hi, Laura. Good to see you. Thank you for joining. I'm going to pull up his case again with the questions. Is that okay? We're just going through the first case right now. Can you guys hear me? This is Jen Boyd. Oh yeah, I can hear you, Jen. Oh, yeah, I can hear you, Jen. Okay, good. I'm I'm driving. It's hard to figure out how to mute, unmute, and remute and all that. But anyway, did you say um, that on the supplicate her levels? It's reminding me of my case weeks ago. Her levels were reversed. That there was more abuse than abuse. Did I hear that right? Yeah, it it, it appeared. Yeah, it, 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 it appeared. That's echoing pretty bad, Jen. Echoing pretty bad, Jen. Oh, sorry. Let me mute. Sorry. There you go. Yeah, it, it appeared that um, when I reviewed her labs while she was on sublocade that they oftentimes were reversed. So um, the the buprenorphine was in a higher ratio than the norbuprenorphine. I don't know if that played, played a factor in it, but that did seem to be um, an, an odd thing that stood out when reviewing her labs. Jen, did you have anything else to add to that or a question? Please be careful because you're driving. <laughs> All right, Nadina, I see your. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jen. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I probably shouldn't keep doing this, but anyway. Um, so did that, did that, um, so let me just say my next question and I'll say my observation so I don't have to try to mute and unmute it. So, I was wondering, my next question was, did that 
then revert when she was back on the or the sublingual and if so could it be um that she meta just metabolizes the injection differently that would seem odd but could she metabolize the injection differently uh, yeah um, i mean you'd have yeah, even yeah, less yeah. less first pass metabolism with the injection than you would the sublingual so you really expect um you know, you'd expect the, the buprenorphine levels to be higher in relation to the norbuprenorphine if they're on injection versus um, sublingual. Trying to see everybody. See, at least anecdotally, the patients I work with, other in Morgantown, I notice a lot of folks that are on a higher dose of bup tend not do so well in the supplicate in general. Um, do you guys offer Bugzati up that way or no? I know you have more options for our strains with that. I'm not even familiar with it. Um, it's just another, which I'm not the expert on it by any means. It's another form of injectable buprenorphine. We started offering, I think in the past few months, we started doing outpatient more. So it's something to investigate. You can do like weekly doses, monthly doses. Oh, the weekly. Okay. Yeah. And there's different strengths. So she potentially need a higher dose of an injectable. Is there something to think about? Is something you guys offer, which I guess you guys don't obviously, but. Yeah, it was just recently put on the Medicaid formulary in January, and I think it's actually preferred. Um, so she should be able to um, to access it if if the patient has you know Medicaid or other insurance. And it is it is a medication with a lot more options, the weekly and the monthly, as well as more dose options, as Jordan was saying. Okay. Also, a much smaller needle, so folks love that a lot too. Excellent, thank you. And Dr. Bo, I see your hand raised. Go ahead. Are we keeping track of these? I mean, in case we need to publish like a case series of patients who do not respond to sublocate. Dr. Corder, do we have we have more than one, or is she the is she the one that that gave us the most feedback on it? <clears throat> yes, yeah, she was the one that most that definitely you know. Um, uh, said that that she wanted back on suboxone as soon as she was able to because you know the sublocate just didn't uh, didn't work well for her it didn't help control her cravings at all so they uh, I just yeah I think um, as Jeremy said what we kind of questioned was uh, I wonder you know if uh, you know physically there's no reason for her to have more cravings on one form of buprenorphine than another wonder if there was any psychological explanations. Uh, Dr. Tabatier. Yeah, so I do think some patients, they've described to me like taking their bup, they get kind of energized with it. So that may go away. And I don't know if it's the bup or kind of some of the serotonin effects or, don't, you know, but they definitely have um, a different experience the same way with some of our patients that use um, opiates that feel energized with it. They describe it similarly. So there may be some physiologic and psychological effects because, you know, most people, you know, that don't have addiction, you know, give them a Percocet, they get, you know, two Percocets, they're knocked out. Our patients tend to say, it energizes them. And I've heard the same thing with the Suboxone when I've asked them. And so there may be kind of, they're, you know, maybe feel not feeling that not and want to feel that feeling, or there may be something physiologic as well. I don't know. Great. Thank you so much for that. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? Jeremy, do you have any other further questions? No, thank you all for your time and the suggestion for Brixotti. And we'll uh, certainly look into that and see if that's a, an option for folks in the future. Great, and thank you so much for the case. We appreciate it.
Sure. All right, we're gonna go to the second case. Peyton, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, I'll share my screen with your case. Give me one moment, please. All right, should be good to go. Um, so we had a 43 year old male patient with polysubstance abuse and history of sexual offenses who was seeking inpatient slash residential treatment um, and then later transitioned to sober living. Um, he's never been on MAT therapy before. Originally, he was an ED referral to us as follow up because he had in irretractable nosebleeds and blood pressure of 210 over 120. Um, once that was controlled, we met with him in the family medicine facility, and we discussed with him his previous pain control regimen of hydrocodone, 10 milligrams twice a day, and Soma, 250 milligrams three times a day. Um, he got that treatment seven years ago after having an accident while mining, um, and his former prescriber discontinued his pain treatment. Um, he's homeless and now states that he utilizes his wife's opioid pain medications, and he occasionally buys from a friend. Past medical history and surgical history is relatively non-revealing. Um, he's a current everyday smoker, current alcohol use daily, history of marijuana use. Um, in the drug screen, he was positive for opioids and marijuana. His hep C panel was negative, And his only current medication is amlodipine, 10 milligrams a day. Um, so our only question was, are there any inpatient residential facilities that accept registered sex offenders? Are there any sober living facilities that accept registered sex offenders? Um, or if you know of any like SUD facilities that offer overlapping sexual offense counseling in conjunction to his substance use disorder counseling? Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? with the case before you go into the recommendations and I can pull it back up if you need to. Uh, definitely are inpatient places that accept registered sex offenders. Uh, as far as any kind of sober living arrangement that would largely depend on who they have to register with because that wouldn't be considered a, a permanent address so they might i don't know see that as an issue as, with their registration because i know he was having issues as far as being homeless he was utilizing a friend's address since they have to have an address on file so I mean, he would have an address for the house, so they would probably take that. But given that for whatever reason, he might, you know, be kicked out or leave the sober living home. So I guess it depends on the, the office's experience with anybody in a situation like that. Um, I know of specific inpatient places that say no. Unless it's like a co-ed uh, residence. Yeah, I do know that there are far fewer uh, residential programs <clears throat> and even sober living. Uh, sober living is a, a an even tougher issue than residential programs for these individuals with, with sexual offenses. Uh, you know it's it's been that way for for quite some time but there are there are a few uh throughout the state you uh, know you know that those are those are often hard to find and and sometimes are are full thank you anybody else have experience with this or comments All right, giving that echo pause. 
Peyton, are you, do you have any other questions or anything? I don't really think so. That's what we were struggling with is we've been calling sort of like one by one. So I didn't know if there was a easier way <laughs> to check. There is a, um, the, the, the recovery residents, most of them have to um, be certified by WBARR, and they have a list of those certified residences. You may want to reach out to them because they have standards so that, that may be included in the standards, whether they do or don't um, have to uh, accept sex offenders. And they could certainly point you to some maybe that do to help save time with calling everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been tedious. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Peyton. We appreciate you and thank you everybody else for your input as well. All right, we'll just move on to our last case. Lola, are you ready for that today? Yes, I'm ready. Yeah, perfect. All right, I'll pull that up. Give me one moment. Okay, thanks. So I can go ahead and start or? Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, the patient I'm presenting today is a 34-year-old uh, female. She initially joined our program uh, back in 2022 um, in May, and uh, initially she actually did really well. She was um, coming regularly. She was taking Suboxone and, and uh, was not relapsing. At that time when she joined initially, her primary substance was Remeth and heroin, um, but she... Um, she had been on probation initially for the first year she was with us. And it was as when she went off probation, she, she had less structure and she started having issues um, and relapsed a couple times over the summer in 2023. By August, she was relapsing regularly and eventually stopped showing up for group and was discharged for that reason. Um, about six or seven weeks later, she reapplied um, and we, re, you know, we reaccepted her, but since that, since then, so that was, you know, several months ago, well, over a year, or no, I'm sorry, several months ago, we just, we've been seeing the same pattern where she'll join the program, but not really getting anywhere in terms of, of relapsing on meth. She doesn't typically relapse on opiates. She does well with the Suboxone, but just consistent meth use and, um, until just recently, we didn't have an ACOAT or an ICOAT. We uh, were a small program and um, I didn't have the time in my schedule for it. But, um, and so we were, you know, we would give her several chances and then discharge her and then she would wait 30 days and then come back. Um, but just really was not seeing any improvement. We did just recently start a high risk group. We're not doing the separate ICOAT and ACOAT because we, we just don't have that space either. But, um, and we added, in addition to the um, group visit and therapy, she's seeing our therapist once a week, and then she's seeing me once a week individually. And we do have contingency management, but we haven't added any extra yet for our high-risk group. Um, so that's where we are with her right now. So she um, has a history of generalized anxiety and major depressive disorder. At uh, I already talked about that. She has actually moved from heroin to fentanyl at this point, still using the meth. Um, she takes Cymbalta, 60 milligrams daily for her anxiety and depression. Doesn't really feel like they control them that well, but has tried a lot of other things and higher doses of the Cymbalta. Hasn't really felt like anything else helped better. Um, as far as options for treating stimulant use disorder, she tried uh, Remeron in the past, but it caused a significant weight gain. So she was unwilling to do that again. And then I had had her on Wilbutrin in the initial admission, but she felt like it was causing irritability and anger. So she came off of that. Um, so right now she lives with a friend, but that friend is actively using meth and fentanyl, doesn't really have any other place to stay, doesn't have a job, even though she wants to have a job because she doesn't have transportation. Um, she has three kids, but doesn't have custody. And this is, this is a reason I bring that up is because it really, um, affects her anxiety and is a trigger for her if there's any issues with, with her kids. So, um, since joining this time, she's, she was using meth daily. She's cut back to every, every couple of days at this point, she's at once or twice a week. Um, 
denies relapse on opiates. She did, and her screens have been negative in general. She had one fentanyl screen that was positive, but unfortunately it happened on a Friday. And by the time we got the results, it was too late to send it for confirmation. But um, at any rate, we're just not really making progress with her meth use. Uh, we've not tried Topamax, but I did just talk to her about that today as a possibility. She has eight weeks left in this high risk group before we would, you know, that's what we've set as the time is 12 weeks. Um, last year in drug screen without math was June of 2023. And really what I'm trying to figure out at this point is, is there anything we can do differently to help her move toward um, abstinence from meth? And then if we do end up discharging her again, and then she reapplies to the program, we're struggling with that balance between you know, she seems to need a higher level of care, but when she's not on Suboxone, she's using fentanyl and is at high risk for overdose with that. Um, and, you know, any other medication options people have tried that they've seen success with for this type of patient. So I didn't, um, in the beginning, is she receiving group therapy only or in any individual therapy? So right now she gets weekly group therapy and a group medication management visit, um, a weekly vi individual visit with me, and then a weekly individual therapy visit. So all three of those things. Yeah, I mean, I'm just exploring a little bit. It, it's going to be very difficult for her to discontinue methamphetamine use if she's living with people who are using methamphetamines, obviously, to stay to state the obvious. Um, yes. And so what do you have an understanding of like what the fear is around going into a residential setting or? Um, she initially, it was because she, um, do you remember what she said about that? It was something about her kids and her parents, why she didn't want to do inpatient. Yeah, so her, um, her parents have custody of her kids, but they do let her see them sometimes. Um, and she was under the impression that if she ended up having to go someplace residential, that she would lose that opportunity to see her kids because her parents would be upset that she was, um, you know, not doing well. Would it be possible, hey Lola, would it be hey. possible to do like maybe some family therapy sessions and bringing the parents in to educate them so she would be able to go to rehab? I did actually bring that up to her at one point, but she was not, she said her mom would never do that, unfortunately. So I think that's a great idea, but um, she didn't seem open to that, so. Um, Laura Simmons asked, does she have any motivation to stop using? That is actually one of the things she's expressed to us is that she she's having a hard time finding motivation. So she's not seeing her kids much, she doesn't have a job. She um, she doesn't have any structure. She doesn't have anything to do. And she just she just feels like she doesn't have a good reason not to use at this point. And, and it's really hard. I don't know how you help someone find that in her situation, you know. Well, it sounds like she, she has that motivation with her children, but she's using it as a barrier to residential mm -hmm. versus using it as a motivation to residential. Because if she went to residential, was able to get more sober time, then, you know, in, she could potentially see her children more than she's seeing them now because she would be more stable. Um, like that's the argument you, you could, or, you know, one vision of the future that might be helpful versus right. one she has currently. So she's told us that the reason her parents won't let her see the kids is not related to her substance use disorder, which I think that's just her um, rationalizing for herself, but we've had a hard time convincing her. Otherwise, that our therapist is working with her on that specifically. So maybe if she makes some progress on that, that'll be helpful. Um, and I have talked to her more recently because what happens is she says, that, you know, something will happen where she feels like she can't be there for her kids when they need her. And that's her trigger. And then she uses, and I've talked to her about, you know, if you really want to be there for them, then in that moment, not using is the, is the main way you can be there for them, you know, but um, she's struggling to, um, you know, recognize that in the moment. So is there, is she constantly using or she have any short periods of time where she isn't? 
She's about once or twice a week at this point. Okay. And um, she did, she made it a week, a full week right. um, recently. And that was the longest she'd done again, since that initial admission. Yeah, so, so. so doing that, she seems like she has some motivation to quit, you know, it may not be continuous. And if she's relapsing and lapsing on that, I probably would try to keep her engaged, you know, at least, I mean, I agree with you. She needs a higher level of care, but you know, it's not that she's using four times a day, every day, all the time. Now that may be more of a harm reduction approach, but I mean, right. she's, she's making some of that and it may be by keeping her engaged, you may be able to get to some of the places that you're talking about where, you know, she, she is in denial. I mean, I mean, she's putting her kids at risk with CPS, with her mom, you know, but everybody losing these kids, if she's having visitate, you know, the way things are, you just have no idea what CPS or neighbors are going to do or, or say, yeah. and, and you're right. Um, but I think, and then maybe looking at some other things that would motivate her, whether it's a driver's license, a GED, you know, anything that keeping her engaged, that would move her forward in her life. Cause you're right. She doesn't have any structure or anything like that, but if she gets her license, maybe she can, do, you know, things like that. Maybe she's not at that place yet either. Um, is, and is she in um, kind of a women's group or mixed group? That may also be another option, you know, kind of, you know, a women's group she may do better in, you know, with different stories and different things like that. But so. yeah, she, it is, a, there, it's not a women's only group, but it's, it only has women in it at the moment. Okay, so. right. <laughs> But that is a good idea to find something else that would be something to work toward that, that could give her some structure. She doesn't have her license, so that might be some, yeah. that's a good idea yeah. to talk to her yeah, about that. The risk of her meth plus fentanyl is higher than once a week meth. I mean, not that it's ideal, but. Right. Right. Which is why we've, you know, continued to readmit her. And, you know, really, she was a motivation for starting this high risk group because we see the trying and she keeps coming and she's high risk of overdose, so. Thank you so much. Yes, Jeremy, go ahead. Um, yeah, one of the things that contingency management is really good for are stimulant use disorders um, in particular. And you mentioned the ICM. Is it structured specifically for stimulants or is it just generalized for something else? I didn't know if you could work that into the motivation piece. It's just generalized right now and we don't we don't split it out in the high risk group. So that's one thing I've thought about is maybe we need to add extra um, smaller rewards, but more frequent rewards for a high risk group. You know, maybe that would help her. You know, because we always give her the goal of, you know, make it to your next visit without relapsing. But if there was some kind of incentive besides just not relapsing, then, you know, maybe that would help. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Go ahead, Derek. Thank you. Uh, if she is, like Laura was saying, uh, kind of using her kids as an excuse not to go into treatment. That could be like, cause that like kind of a contradictory thing of, you know, like how it's affecting her kids and her status with them, but also kind of keeping her from doing anything. Um, it could be because she doesn't feel that she's capable of doing anything. So it's kind of like just self-sabotaging to prevent any future failure. If you have anybody who has like some skills with motivational interviewing who can work that with them, um, if you adhere to self-determination theory, then everybody has an inherent motivation to do things for themselves. It's a matter of getting them to see that. Uh, so I'd say somebody who's good with double reflective listening to kind of point out the inconsistencies and help her see how this could be good for her life and her kids build that motivation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, our, our therapist does motivational interviewing, so I can I can talk about that specifically with her. Yeah, the other thing we found, Lola, um, we do we struggle with contingency management, honestly. But we we took some of the money and bought a whole closet full of stuff, and a lot of the stuff was not for the patients; it was for their family members. So oh. gifts for the kids. Oh, um, that's we a good found idea. When they got toys for the kids, when they got, you know, Christmas came around. 
journals were journals were a big thing for the patients themselves but you know things that the kids could put their hands on maybe mm-hmm. something use that in her way you know the the negative side was you can't see your kids unless you make it a week well that probably won't work right. um, but, just, but you can see your kids more or you can bring you know what do your kids like legos you know i know that they're you know there's like you know five dollar lego things or vouchers that you can add up to go to the toy store or something like that. Mm-hmm. That may be helpful as a contingency management because I, I struggle with to give people to to motivate them, but in her, that may work. Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. Yeah. Do you have access to any peers or peer recovery coaches? Yes, we have. With? We have two. Um, are the one we've had for the, for a long time that's got a lot of experience is male and she doesn't really um but we just hired a female she just she's in training right now but once she's um completed her training then we're, we're gonna assign her to to this patient and um yeah maybe that's another good resource that will be helpful for her i think back to your original question was like if she discharges again like, do we re-accept her back if she shows up again? Um, and this is something you and I have talked about, you know, all the time. But uh, my my thoughts are, if they're not, you know, if they're not willing to go to a higher level of care, like we think they should, I've been, like you said, Dr. Baltier, I sort of switch over to a harm reduction, you know, plan for for a while and and just try to keep them in treatment as much as possible all the time all the time. Well, and that's what, yeah, I would take her back years. again and again and again. Well, and that's my, definitely my inclination. Um, but you know, different people have different opinions and I just wanted to, uh, that's not necessarily the opinion of everybody in the program. And so, um, thought it would be helpful to get other, other providers and other, you know, group, uh, program members thoughts on that as well. So, I was just um, going to share too that in, in building motivation, one thing I have found to be useful, it's actually a smart recovery tool. It's called Hierarchy of Values. And if you go to the smart recovery page, there's a toolkit there. It's free. You can download it right off the um, smart recovery page. But that one I have found has been pretty impactful in building motivation. Um, I also, when I use it, um, you know, people will list their hierarchy of values, which almost always include their family and their children. And then um, I get a little dramatic with it and take a big red marker and put an X over all that and put drugs as number one. Because anytime you choose, you know, to continue using meth or whatever illicit substance, you're, you're basically prioritizing that over the things that they say are the most important to them. Um, I've, had it, I've had it really hit home with a few people that might be something worth trying. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. I think just, I don't know. I think that they don't really realize that they it is impacting their parenting, even though they are still able to see their kids. They're not completely present with, with the visit, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And- Thank you, everybody, for it, but I don't want this off. So please, if you have anything else, um, chime in. And Lola, do you have any other questions? Um, I can't really think of any, but this has been really great input. So thank you, everybody. You have some good ideas, I think, to try. So Absolutely. And you can always do this again and do a follow-up. We'd like to see, you know, with any of your cases anybody brings. Please remember, you can do a follow-up good Semi good news, bad news, whatnot. Um, we would love to hear that. All right. I just have a couple of announcements to make. Um, so first off, <laughs> Nietzsche, you can stop recording. 